live from San Francisco, California. It's The Cube at VMworld 2014, brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Hi, this is Stu Miniman with Wikibon.org. Here with SiliconANGLE TV's fifth year VMworld 2014, San Francisco, California. Had a little bit of an earthquake Saturday night. Uh, it definitely uh, kicked things off to a start, at least for me. First time I'd seen a magnitude six earthquake not too far no. from me. Um, but we're going to be talking about the cloud in, in this segment. Uh, joining me, uh, first time uh, CUBE guest uh, for both of you, uh, it's uh, Matt Calger, who's the global VMware architect for EMC, and Patrick Noya, uh, who covers cloud ops and infrastructure program management for VMware. Guys, uh, thanks so much for joining me. Good, thanks for having us. Thank you. All right, uh, so Patrick, it's, let me start with you. Tell me a little sure. bit of you know, your role at VMware and uh, you know, what, what you're doing here. So I, I work for uh, the internal private cloud for VMware called OneCloud, and in that regard, I am the cloud operations and infrastructure program manager. Okay, so uh, you know we heard a lot at the in, in the keynote about how the hybrid cloud re renamed vCloud Air, uh, yes. you know through a lot of the partnerships, but that's a different group from you. That, um, that's correct. Um, so you guys uh, can, can give us just a quick, you know, what's the history of the internal cloud uh, from, from VMware? So it was it was an alignment that came about uh, three years ago by where um, VMware needed to consolidate and to really um, bring together all of the cloud um, infrastructure and service offerings we had internally into a single overarching kind of orchestration and delivery mechanism called OneCloud. All right, and, and, and Matt, uh, you know, you, you're working with Patrick because the hands-on lab you know, runs out of this cloud, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, so, so I have to ask first of all, do we have this conference every year in Moscone because it's not too far from Palo Alto and therefore easier or for the <laughs> labs to work? Or Actually, uh, um, we have three primary data centers that are serving uh, as the infrastructure to run hands-on labs. Yes, one of them is local in Santa Clara, but the other two, one is in Washington, uh, Wenatchee, Washington, and the other is in Amsterdam. Okay, so, so, so really the Barcelona show will be running off the Amsterdam uh, you know, data center? Uh, not primarily, it okay. would be one of the, the main sites, but at any point in time, the infrastructure that actually is delivering hands-on lab can be distributed um, anywhere in the world. So it's not necessarily one that takes over just because it's local, or, or closer, if you will. Okay, Matt, and, and what, what's EMC's uh, part in the hands-on lab? We've we supported the hands-on labs since uh, I, th I think the very beginning. Uh, I can remember all the way back to 2009, uh, having a bunch of uh, CX4s and those kinds of things back then. Uh, today we supply uh, pretty much exclusively Extreme IO storage for these labs because that's just the right product for the right job. Uh, and I think the, we support the, the majority of the, the storage for that lab at this point. Okay, okay, okay. unpack that uh, for us a little. Why, why Extreme I.O.? Obviously I would say performance has to be you know, number one on the list there, but what, why Extreme I.O.? Uh, you know, I think I might defer to, to Patrick a little bit. I, I would probably argue that uh, reliability is probably your, your highest priority. Well, I think it's, it's actually a multitude of things. Okay. Um, it, you know, obviously performance is, is critical. Reliability is paramount. Um, but it's it's also the content itself and how we can leverage different platforms and this be, you know with the most optimal being extreme IO because of the high dedupe ratio that we can achieve on the actually underlying labs. Great. So a lot of it comes down to you know, a platform like Extreme IO where you've got multiple controllers, you know, two controllers per brick, and we've got multiple bricks in every cluster, uh, means that a brick failure or something like that is not a hugely catastrophic event for us, and then just ridiculously high consistent IOs uh, and sub millisecond response times all the time guaranteed means that Patrick's team can just rely that it's just going to work. Uh, and in fact, I believe Patrick, last year, the first time uh, that you guys had 100% storage uptime was uh, last year on Extreme IO. That's absolutely correct. All right, so, so uh, does anybody have, what speeds and feeds, what, what, what kind of hero numbers can you share about what, what you've done at the show so far this year, or you know, what the plan is? Well, the show isn't over, so yeah. I mean, obviously it would be based on the last couple of days, but what I can tell you now is that compared to last year where we had both traditional storage platform and extreme IO, this year, um, outside of the SDD in infrastructure, it's 100% extreme IO. And in that regard, we're actually increasing the scope, obviously, but we're actually diminishing the footprint. What we've come to understand and appreciate at Extreme IO is the flexibility and power of the platform. By where, at this, at this stage, we're able to conceivably run 100% off the show, off two bricks. 
and compared to last year with the traditional uh, storage platform, we achieved that same scope in six rack, full racks. <laughs> so you went from six full racks to 12U. Uh, in and of itself is it amazing. So Patrick, uh, you know, when, when you build out the labs, you know, how much is the you know, application uh, a focus of uh, building there? Get, getting some questions from, from uh, kind of those watching. A application in, in, the, in the actually what the lab content is serving up? Yeah, exactly. Oh, it, ab absolutely, it's, it's, it's paramount to the delivery because there's obviously a consideration on the formation uh, and, pr and presentation of that lab but also um, on the performance impact that that lab will have on the underlying infrastructure. Some labs are, are relatively minor, they mean more interactive clicks through. Others have a, a massive impact in translation to the, you know, the performance characteristics that we need to um, you know, align to from an infrastructure standpoint. Okay, and you know, so I assume the internal cloud is something that lives on you know, well beyond the kind of the VMworld shows. How much is there a build up you know, for this event or does this run on kind of the existing infrastructure? Well, no, there is a burst element. Um, normally we don't have you know, 550 concurrent people um, you know, mm -hmm. demanding upwards of 15,000 VMs at any point in time. So there is a burst element, but there's also very much a steady state. This is our internal private cloud. This isn't necessarily purposely built just for this one event and then you know, decommissioned. And, and to that point, the, the one cloud and, and the, all the, the stuff that supports it, Project Knee and so on and so forth, actually is running 100% of the time uh, yes. for, for customers live and ready to yeah, go. One of the new services we launched last year was actually HOL Public, by where the HOL labs you know, lived on well after you know, VMworld was over, and by where people, customers can come in and continue to take labs throughout the year. All right, so uh, you know, Matt, you know, You've been in the lab so far. You know things things running pretty smooth. You know we, we we don't have you know big big lines. I remember 2010. I think I came there. <laughs> I remember 2010. Had lines out the door. Uh, is, is some of those things. You know what, what what have you seen over the last few years uh, as kind of the maturity of uh, what what goes on in the hands-on labs? Well, I think you know to your point back in 2010 and even maybe 2011, uh, there were definitely lines uh, you know out the door. You know, there were some some stability issues and. Uh, I think you know. Ever since uh, Patrick's team took on a lot of this, and you know, it was it was really treated like this critical environment that people had to use, like a, a true 24/7 environment. The, the availability has been incredible this year, 100% uptime. Last year, 100% uptime, and uh, it's so far. I can't imagine any complaints. When I when I go in, I was just in the uh, in the room earlier and looking at the arrays. Uh, one of them, the one of the ones in Santa Clara, is. Uh, had a bit of a hot, hot moment uh, for it, which was uh, 53,000 IOs a second, which is not even a third of what we rate that system for. Uh, but most of the time, they kind of just hover there at maybe 10% of what they're capable of. Okay, and can I ask, is there anything, are, are there converged infrastructures used as this, or any rest of the cloud suite? How, what, what kind of plugs in beyond the ex extreme IO? How does, that, how does that connect with everything no, else? No, we, we definitely, I mean, the, the purpose of VMworld is to showcase our latest, greatest technologies, so we do have about 10% of hands-on lab running on all of Evo Rack um, and vSAN, so our latest technologies. It's, it's definitely a, a showcase, and we want to put it in the most visible light um, possible. Yeah, um, that's the Evo Rack, not the Evo Rail. That's Evo Rack. Okay. Which is which is interesting because we're actually the lab for Evo Rail yeah. is running on Evo Rack. <laughs> okay. Can, yeah. Can, can you uh, you know it, it, it's new to a lot of people. Can you kind of sure. you know tease out for us a little bit kind of the the Rail versus Rack? We talked a little bit about Rail earlier, uh, kind of uh, you know four, four servers uh, kind of in a configuration with a, a number of partners. How, how does that differ from the the Rail and what can we expect to see there? So unfortunately, I, I don't know much about the, the rail. Um, from an Evo rack standpoint, um, absolutely, it's, it's all converged infrastructure um, predicated on like vSAN technologies by where we can leverage internal storage to deliver similar infrastructure and compute platforms than where you would consider more traditionally um, you know, that we've aligned to. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it's interesting. I to think about you know vSAN has a certain set of applications that mm -hmm. it's really geared for, as opposed to say Extreme IO. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there there's some overlap. You know, for example, you know VDI could fit uh, in both of those, uh, but other than that, you know, I, I think of you know Extreme IO. I mean, you know, database environments, something that uh, you know would be a great fit for you know an all flash array mm -hmm. versus you know not necessarily where vSAN's first target is. Uh, any, any comments on that, Matt? I think it's interesting because. When, when, you, when you look at the actual the I.O. profiles that, that OneCloud uh, tends to push into these systems, we, we looked at them closely last year after the show, 
and they are uh, incredibly write heavy, uh, more so than I think I would have expected, and they're incredibly uh, latency sensitive. Um, if, if, if those latencies start to, to get up there in the you know, five, six, seven milliseconds range, customers really start to feel it. Okay. And so both of those really play well into, into the designs of both Extreme IO and vSAN. vSAN's great at you know, some of this low latency stuff, the thing, stuff that it can do with data locality and that sort of thing. And Extreme IO is great at that too. Does somebody want to add, Patrick? Or? Well, I, I actually I don't think the the conversation is, is separate from you know what we what we're doing with Evo Rack and what we're doing with Extreme IO. I think as the cloud infrastructure and operations team, you have a, vari a variety of platforms and architecture that you can align to, and, it, mm -hmm. and it's all it's all based on the on the use case and what you what your customers you know, requirements are. So great. Uh, so I'm I'm just curious, you know, maybe, Patrick, maybe it's for you. Is uh, you know what lessons do you learn every year at VMworld? You know, building kind of year over year. Does any of what goes on on here at VMworld, you know, translate yeah. itself into uh, kind of product requirements? Of, of course, absolutely. I think the biggest lesson learned in something like VMworld is that you can take lessons learned from the past, but don't think that they're going to translate 100% into the, into the present. And it's an ongoing learning process. And I think that with any cloud infrastructure and operations team that, that defines how we do business every day. All right, yeah. Matt, uh, you know, anything else you, you kind of want to share from you know, what you've seen in the maturity? You know, where, 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 where's the opportunity for us to kind of move the labs forward? You know, I think it's, I think it's interesting. I'd love to see uh, continued use of uh, Evo Rack and Evo Rail uh, to push those. One of the things that we've been hearing a lot from VMware recently is their increased desire to sort of dog food their, their own stuff. Right? Yeah, I think Pat, Pat actually said this morning, it's extreme dog fooding. Extreme so. dog fooding, and, and I think this is, this is a great start to see more of it. Um, and you know we can help with certain parts of it. You know, Extreme IO certainly can stress uh, an ESX I host pretty well, uh, deliver almost anything that, that it could possibly ask for. And then we can also stress the other parts of it, sort of the SDDC and vSAN sides. Um, so what I really look forward to is sort of pushing that envelope even further to, to Patrick's point about let's try to see we've historically uh, overbuilt these environments a little bit. Um, but now we're actually starting to, to de decrease the footprint a little bit to see how much can we really get this down to something even closer to a customer uh, possible uh, scenario. Yeah, uh, Matt, uh, you know, since, since I've got you on here, I mean, you, you've done some interesting tests looking at really scalable architectures. Right. I mean, I, I know I read your blogs that you did on, on, on Scale.io. Um, you know, do, do you do the labs yourself? You know, did, are you involved in some of the architecture pieces? You know, how, how does it play into kind of your, you know, day-to-day -day job? Uh, are, you, are you talking about the hands-on labs, or? I'm saying, so, uh, I'm saying, do, right, do you take some of the labs and, you know? Oh, I absolutely take the labs. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's probably one of my most favorite things to do here. Okay. I, I honestly, if I were a customer, yeah. um, my top two things to do would be to come take the labs yeah. and go to what are sort of listed as the advanced technical sessions. Um, I always end up taking a lab and I never have time to take all the labs that I want. Yeah. Uh, I think my favorite so far this year has been the uh, advanced NSX lab. Okay. Um, my, my weakest area is networking and so uh, I learned a lot from that lab. Okay. Yeah, Patrick. Anything you know? What what's been, what's been hot this year? Is yeah, had to reconfigure. De definitely you know? everything we're doing with the Evo Rack, Evo uh, Evo Rail, yeah, uh, new, and, so. and and NSX is, are all they're basically the top three labs oh. at this point. It's it's very exciting what those technologies can offer and bring to the market. Okay. So uh, yeah, I, I, I think I just want to give you each a last last chance to kind of give a plug for you know something they should check out. There's two more days left, and uh, I'm sure there's things that people can follow up afterwards. So Matt, I'll let you start. Uh, well, you know, I, I think I'd have to plug my session. Come on, uh, I have a session this afternoon uh, on automating very, very large-scale uh, environments uh, using things like Python and VCO and, and those kinds of technologies. So, if you want to take what you learn about the infrastructure side of that and, and things like Evo Rack and Evo Rail and, and Extreme IO and apply those to an environment with hundreds or even thousands of hosts and how to deal with that in the same fashion. It's a good place to start. All right, and we can also find some of your stuff. Uh, hopefully you'll be having your findings on your blog. My, it's always on my blog, exaforge.com. All right, and Patrick? Yeah, and just um, for me, come visit us in Hands On Labs. Please take a lab, uh, come visit us in the NOC. Uh, we this year, like the year previous, we want to be you know full disclosure, full visibility, so we have the monitoring up, it's all real time. Uh, feel free to ask us any questions you might have. 
Yeah, and, and if, if somebody's not at VMworld or they don't get to all the labs, you know, how, how do they engage uh, you know, in between the shows? So once VMworld San Francisco actually uh, concludes over the course of the next two to three weeks, we're going to be migrating all of the 2014 content into HOL Public, so they'll be able to yeah. take the lab at that time. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming. Uh, you, you know, definitely when, when I talk to the practitioner, the hands-on labs are you know, always some of the highlights for them. Uh, so we will be right back with our continuous coverage from VMworld after this quick break.